Well, I've been asked to speak first, and that's given me the uh, sort of preemptive privilege of putting up some slides, which I've taken advantage of. Um, and my first slide is um, actually a quote from a uh, review of Piketty uh, by Paul Krugman, um, where he uh, celebrates the fact that this is a book which is, as he sees it, fundamentally about uh, explaining and understanding inequality. And obviously, being Krugman, he celebrates the fact uh, that this is something which, which, which orthodox uh, e economists have not wanted to do. And it is interesting, I notice on the programme for this um, conference, that the issue of inequality is the, the, the heading of two of the, of the sessions, which I think is unusual uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the Economic History Conference uh, proceeding. So I don't know whether that's the indirect impact uh, of Piketty uh, on economic historians. Well, I thought it useful to uh, remind you I assume everybody's read the book, of course, uh, but perhaps uh, to tell you, if you somehow haven't, that this is the basic story um, that Piketty tells. And one of the things, obviously, about the book is that it works at a number of different levels. Partly it works at the level of these very basic, simple, fundamental laws. Um, and these are the ones which he, he sets out. Um, the first one um, is basically an accounting identity, um, as, he, as he points out. Uh, the second one is what he calls his second fundamental law, which is obviously much more problematic um, that the, uh, 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 the capital income ratio in the long run is equivalent to the savings rate over the growth rate. And then third, and I think this is the sort of uh, uh, equation, the, the, this is the statement which, which is the sort of key note uh, to many people's uh, appreciation of, of Piketty, is that, it, it, um, that the rate of return um, will exceed um, the growth rate of the economy. And in some ways, that's the sort of core proposition which he makes uh, in, in the book. So those are the fundamental laws as he characterises them. And what then he goes on to argue is, uh, at a slightly more empirical uh, level, uh, is that there is, uh, in terms of this relationship between R and G, uh, there is, he claims, a very, very long-run normal relationship um, which is that R uh, is roughly 4 to 5 percent, G is roughly 1.5 to 2 percent. There are deviations from that, and those deviations in some cases seem to last quite a long time, but basically in the very long run, that's the relationship uh, uh, which holds. But what he argues is that in the 20th century, we deviated from that long run norm um, so that uh, uh, R, um, <coughs> excuse me, R was depressed uh, by war and depression. Um, uh, after the first war, after the second war, it was de uh, depressed by taxes and then by the nationalisations, and uh, also for a period, and he's focusing here on Western Europe uh, and the OECD world, uh, G was higher in the, in the golden age, um, and that raised uh, G to a higher level. But, he argues, the long-run relationship has reasserted itself um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the recent uh, past, um, particularly, but not beginning, but certainly particularly manifest uh, in the, since the 1970s. And what, of course, he's projecting is that this uh, now will become the new normal, particularly, but not only, uh, in, the, in the OECD uh, world. Now, the narrative of the book, then, is that a rejection of, of, of the Kuznets curve, which suggested that there would be a natural evolution as, as capitalism developed towards more equality. He's, it's a story about why there's more inequality. Um, and he argues that most of the fall of I in income inequality in the first half of the 20th <coughs> century was due to a fall in capital accumulation. So he's interested in overall income uh, uh, equalities, but he's saying the big driver uh, is, is uh, this, uh, the, the, the accumulation of capital. And he also goes on to argue very clearly that the increase in equality which then took place uh, was not mainly due to democratisation, it wasn't due to egalitarian politics, but it was due to in terms of inequality, con the contingent effects uh, of uh, capital taxation, uh, particularly capital taxation after the First War, aimed at uh, debt re reduction. Now, one of the most, this, as you might expect, you may know, there are hundreds of reviews of this book. Uh, and you, know, you, can spend a, you could spend a, a very long time reading all the reviews, and I certainly have only read a very, very small proportion of them. Um, but one of them, uh, I think, has a very 
clear exposition of one of the central issues um, of uh, the book, uh, which is by James Galbraith. And he says, Piketty's book about capital is neither about capital in the sense used by Marx, nor about the physical capital that serves as a factor of production in the neoclassical model of economic growth. It is a book mainly about the valuation placed on tangible and financial assets, the distribution of those assets through time, and the inheritance of wealth from one generation to the next. And I think that is a very apt summary uh, of much of Piketty's uh, book. Now, one of the issues which this raises and has been uh, very interestingly addressed by actually some other, other French economists, as you might expect, French economists have been particularly uh, 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 enthusiastic about refuting some of Piketty's uh, propositions for, for, for understandable uh, reasons of national pride or, or personal advancement or whatever. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a very nice piece by uh, Bonnet et al., which points out that one of the fundamental issues uh, derived from this, this the, the way in which Piketty uh, defines capital um, is that uh, uh, such a large proportion of it is actually the housing stock. And they suggest that about half uh, of the capital of which he's measuring uh, is actually uh, uh, in housing. And they also go on to point out that the uh, rising capital income ratio, which is a central part of Piketty's proposition, actually derives, 70% of it they uh, calculate, actually derives from uh, the, the change in the price of housing. And I think that makes you know, a hell of a lot of difference about how one thinks about what he, he's actually suggesting. He does have a, I think, quite ambiguous view about what's going on in relation to housing. Because at one point he does say, and I quote him, make no mistake, the growth of a true patrimonial or propertied middle class was the principal structural transformation of the distribution of wealth in the developed countries in the 20th century. And that that's mainly to do with housing. So, the, the middle class, I perhaps should say, he, his, his way of thinking about the population is usually to divide it into the top 10%, the next 40%, and then the next 50%. And his middle class, which is quite an expansive one, it's that group in the distribution between the 50th and the 10th uh, uh, proportions. So that's his, that he's recognising on the one hand that uh, this, this, uh, dis this uh, significance of, of housing within uh, his, dis his definition of capital is so important and, and suggesting some of the implications of that. But on the other hand, uh, I don't think that once you recognise how important housing is, um, that it really fits very well with his, his overall story. Because the story of housing, there's all sorts of aspects of that, which I'm sure other, other people are going to comment on. Um, but one obvious one is actually the distribution of housing wealth is much different than, it, than the distribution of other uh, assets. I mean, I had a very quick look at the, at the latest ONS data on that. And, and it's, it's calculated in a very different way from Piketty. But the, the, the basic point uh, is that the Gini coefficient for, for, for housing is about 0.64, whereas for financial wealth, it's about 0.92. So there's a huge difference in the, in the uh, equality <laughs> of distribution of housing and other uh, particularly financial uh, assets. The quote at the beginning uh, of here, again from Piketty, he says, the history of the distribution of wealth has always been deeply political and it cannot be reduced to purely economic mechanisms. Well, he says that, but actually I think that's in tension with a great deal of what is said <coughs> elsewhere uh, in the text, where pu purely economic mechanisms in some senses are what he is focusing uh, uh, Upon. Um, and so I think there is a, there is a real problem about the, the different levels of sort of generality <coughs> that the text uses. This kind of, this great model, which is very easy to write down and so on, uh, actually uh, uh, seen as a, as, a, as a kind of economic summary, does it really help us to explain uh, what's actually happened to patterns of uh, inequality? And my, uh, given that this is my own particular interest, is, you know, post 45 Britain, it seems to me <coughs> difficult to 
believe that the kind of mechanisms that he's talking about have been the major contributors to uh, changes in inequality uh, in uh, post-war uh, Britain. That's partly to do with, as I've already mentioned, the issue about housing. Um, but it seems to me if one wanted a sort of short list of the kinds of things which drove the rise in equality in the period up until the 1970s, and as I'm sure people know, the 1970s is really the break point in Britain in terms of the shift in inequality. The kinds of things one would indicate as having reduced inequality in that period would be a progressive tra tax structure, which is not primarily focused on capital <laughs> taxation. Obviously, there is a capital taxation element, but it isn't primarily focused on that. It would relate to uh, a, a, progress a progressive tax structure, remembering that today the tax structure is broadly proportional. The, the tax structure is now a broadly proportional one. There is, there is no progressivity in it, um, whereas in this period there is clearly significant uh, progressivity. The priority according to, un to unemployment, I would say, was a very important aspect uh, of you know, impacting on the labour market and therefore an inequality. The social security net, obviously, uh, uh, I think everybody who's, who's studied these things would accept that changes in social security, uh, particularly from the 1980s onwards, have been a major contributor to uh, the, the, the end of, of a relatively egalitarian income distribution. The, the, de the delegitimization of trade unions. Um, so it seems to me that um, while you know, one reads a book of 450 pages and gets a lot out of it, that uh, there is a sense in which the, the kind of different levels at which the, the, the book works uh, uh, don't actually pay off entirely in terms of explaining what I would regard uh, as the key features of the, ch uh, the reasons for the changes in distribution um, that, uh, that have taken place. And if you look at what's happened since the mid-70s, I mean, the standard list of the kind of things which have occurred, which have reduced uh, equality, uh, skill bias, technical change, uh, rise in trade, uh, unemployment, of course, uh, the delegitimization and weakening of trade unions. Um, and I think those were the kind of things that I think one would, one would focus uh, uh, upon. Final point I would make, um, and I think in one sense, uh, and I think it's a very um, sharp uh, review by a uh, person some of you may know, Carol Williams, uh, of, of the Piketty book, um, which is very uh, rude, uh, agreeably rude in some ways, uh, about the naivety of the, of the policy uh, proposals uh, in there. Um, but one of the uh, points, I think, that, that comes from that is that the approach to equality in the book is, in a, quite an important sense, pretty apolitical, really. You know, the, the, the reductions and changes in inequality are, are, are not seen as politically uh, uh, driven. And I'm, I'm sign off by saying that if you want a kind of neoclassical economics book which is very informative about the politics of inequality, I would read Stiglitz rather than Piketty, uh, I, think, I think, in many ways. From within that framework, uh, Stiglitz is, is in some respects much better.